Welcome to Debt to Cinema. I'm Stephen Malmanex. And I'm Brian Gillis. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, you can sadly put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibilities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we miss, despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time central classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell, it might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. There is an ancient legend of a place known as the City of the Dead. We call it the doorway to hell. Where the earliest pharaohs were said to have hidden the wealth of Egypt. Are we going into battle? There's something out there. Something underneath that sand. They came to uncover its secrets. Mummies, my good son. This is where they made the mummies. <laughs> They sought to unlock its treasure. And then there was light. Oh, boy. What they did... Oh, my God. It does exist. I think this may be the Book of the Dead. ...was unleash a force unlike any the world has ever known. You must not read from the book! Obviously, we got the new... Mummy series starting the universal the, dark universe, the new new mummy. But it's funny, you know, going. But we actually have reviewed one Steven Summers film, which yeah, which neither of us expected to do that. I don't think that was mainly because of Anton Yelchin. But you know, you go back to the last decade and. This he guy, popped. he was the original shepherd of the Universal Monsters universe, even he though was it's, the original Zack Snyder. Uh, please elaborate there. Little know nothing dude who no one's heard of makes a couple of smaller films and now nowhere gets the keys of the kingdom. Why don't yeah, you make but, everything for our studio? He did two mummy movies. Uh, he did but Man Stephen Helsing. Summers did stuff he in the did, '90s though. Like Zack Snyder exploded with 300. That was his second film, and it just came out of nowhere. I've seen a lot of Stephen Summers films. I've never did you know seen he did his a Jungle, Jungle Book? Book movie in the '90s. Like, yes, I, I looked that he up. Did Holy two shit! Two Disney movies. He's I didn't Jungle know Book. there was a. Did, I thought the John Favreau one was a remake. No. I didn't know that there was another live action one. There, he did a Huck Finn movie. He did a yeah. couple of different things. He did uh, in '98, the year before this. I would have to imagine the reason why Universal gave him the keys to the kingdom. He made some small, little micro-budget horror film that must have made some good money. Called like Ghost Ship, not Ghost Ship, but like the the tagline is uh, "Full Scream Ahead." But I mean, okay? also, you know, I even I had to look up the stuff on the Jungle Book remake, and that seemed like a pretty decent sized budget for the 90s too i watched the trailer i mean that movie looks pretty epic and but uh, he, as far as them shooting in the actual jungle too so he was no stranger to shooting these uh you know these big budget uh tent poles of the time anyway that are supposed to look very grand and and yeah i mean you know it's like i said he pretty much was the first guy even though it, it wasn't a big shared universe but mm -hmm. he was mainly Almost. known for Universal monster movies because he did three of them: this one, The Mummy Returns, and Van Helsing. And then the What's one, even... the odd one out is that there's GI Joe from the last decade. But yeah, he doesn't have that big a filmography. The real thing too is that Universal probably had their back up against the wall. People were making a, like several Frankenstein films in the '90s. There's the one that stars uh, Robert De Niro, um, Dracula. Obviously, yeah. you got Francis Ford Coppola among others. Yeah, even Wes Craven doing like Vampire in Brooklyn, um, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. I think there might have been one of those in the '90s too. And so they didn't really have the creatures they could have gone with. Swamp Thing was a thing, so maybe they didn't want to do Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, Wolfman probably too expensive. And they're trying to craft this mummy reboot for God knows what reason. And they initially wanted like a Blumhouse type flick. They wanted like a $15 million budget. They approached people that could possibly make it for them. They went to Wes Craven. They went to Clive Barker, George Romero. And all of them, they said, no, it's too gory. It's too bloody. It's too scary. We want something accessible. We want a tent pole. And well, they also they, they wanted to Steven do it Summers. like there's other mummy movies too. They wanted to do it with you know guys in bandages because you look at the original one with Boris Karloff. It really, which I've seen like ten minutes. Yeah, like and it really of. isn't that he's only wrapped up for like just the the first like time that you see him, and then after that it's just Boris Karloff with wrinkles. You know what's crazy about this though? This is an Alphaville production. Like, do you, does that name mean anything to you? I've seen it. I saw it right at the end. What else have Jim they done? Jim Jacks, uh, Sean, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name now, but the guys that produce Mallrats, that okay, produced Dazed and Confused, uh, yeah, yeah. Tombstone, yeah, Jim Jacks, uh, who died 
fairly recently. Um, I, I know, you know, that I first heard of him uh, through, through Mallrats and through Kevin Smith, and I know that he was at the 10th anniversary Q&A, so that's how I was aware that, you know, he was, he was a guy that um, a lot of people seem to really like. Like, they got nothing bad to say about him, and you see the guy talk, and he just really seems like a genuinely nice guy, just mm-hmm. a good producer that has your back, but... Uh, I mean, so yeah, I I did not know that he produced this at all. I knew him mainly for producing like those smaller movies. So yeah, just Alphaville. That's uh, that's kind of insane to me. Uh, but that's that's pretty awesome. This movie's kind of insane. Just the way it starts, it it almost gives you a um, what you call like a fake pass. It, it begins very much like one of the original Universal Monster movies, where you have this backstory that's like a little sexy, a little dark kind of scary like a foreboding tale with this uh really. like I, ethnic like a voiceover where it's they don't like, start that way really sexy like the old ones really they always they, start with the swan lake uh they weren't theme, sexy and then they but just i mean jump in to it in like, terms this of is, the the actual like voiceover here yeah, like this um, is a prologue yeah it's a it's a prologue but it also kind of at least in some way kind of sets up this world these characters and uh, just it felt old fashioned to me. Like I don't think it's a coincidence that Stephen Summers wanted the original Universal logo, the black and white one, that he was able to get on Van Helsing. Because you do have a. He didn't. Uh, he, it wasn't the original one. No, it was really well, not cool original. What he did. Not the one with the plane, but the the black no, no, and no, white no. logo. It, it was the uh, modern logo of the time. But what was cool about no, it? I'm, yeah, no, 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 mm. no, no. Uh, this is how it started. It started in color. And then it starts, the color starts changing. It goes into black and white, and, and then, then that it universal turns into logo like... flames up, turns into fire, and then it just, it, and then you see a torch being brought up as you see the villagers going up to, uh, to Frankenstein's castle to burn the place down. And it's a really, a really, really cool way to open that movie. You get a cool custom logo here, too, where the universal globe turns into a sun, and then yeah. that's like rising on a pyramid. Um, and everyone knows I'm a fan of the custom logo. I can't remember what the Mummy Returns did. Uh, Who cares? I, I believe it had to have done something. Them putting but... a kid in that movie was like the worst decision. It's like that said it. It's it's only two years later, except it's actually like nine years in this, See, in this liked, universe. I liked the movie at the, at the time. That was that's the first one I saw. This is why we're doing this, by the way, mm-hmm. because that's those are the rules of the show. Is that it has to be something that either one or both of us have not seen. And it's the same deal with Men in Black. I've seen The Mummy Returns. I've seen uh, The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor for whatever god-awful fucking that, reason. Uh, the day no that I reason. saw that was a Brendan Fraser double feature because I saw I saw Journey to the Center of the Earth in 3D that day. Uh, <laughs> you see Mummy so, in 3D? No. I heard the no, post-conversion it, it, it on wasn't that was in 3D. real bad. It wasn't? There was no 3D, no. I thought it was post conversion. No, 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 no. We were not at that time yet. Was that um, 08? Yeah. I remember, I know Journey 2 was in 3. Yeah. It was not with Brendan Fraser for no, whatever reason. No, the recast, yeah. the, they put The Rock as the character instead. Because, you know, that's something that happens in films that uh, star people. that's how we got San Andreas, because that director was yes. like, I want to keep working with this guy. I think it was more like people were like, you work really good with The Rock. Why don't you make more films with him? Why don't you make Rampage also? Brad Payton, good people. Brad Payton. And then also uh, yeah, Scorpion King. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I love The Scorpion King. That movie is awesome. That's the second best Mummy movie. Well, as, of the the reboot franchise, yeah. the first reboot franchise. I am curious to recheck out uh, the Mummy Returns at Hell. Maybe even the Mummy, the Mummy. Three. I mean, no, no, you don't uh, want to so see that one. I, I don't know. I, they recast some... Rachel Vice, who's awesome in the first two movies. Oh yeah, no, Maria Bella was in there for whatever fucking for, reason because they couldn't terrible. get Rachel Vice. I, I think she was doing like the readers. I'm like she was, you know, doing serious movies at that point she was no longer trying to she make was in brothers Busters. bloom that year it, also it, no, i mean Ra- rachel bloom. weiss like straight up shut it down uh d- did not want to do the mummy uh three because the script was not good enough the fact that, that was the official reason michelle yo and jet lee in that film is not directed by steven summers Fucking, it do was you remember like, the yetis in there yeah like, it was they, like they over the top in, these, CG like abominable weird snowmen shit. and they start doing like kung fu shit if like, i remember it, correctly before that bomb last year the great wall the the 
Tomb of the Mum- Mummy Emperor or whatever was them trying to use the Great Wall of China as like a security fence to keep these monsters in. Like it was the same concept as ten years earlier, mm-hmm. and no one went for that movie. Like this thing. Well, was China went for that movie. I mean, it was well, a of hit course it, it, they had lots of Chinese stars, and it was yeah. set in China, and they didn't have many movies back then that tried to uh, touch into that fan. Well, they base. were smart. They made money, and they liked it. Weirdos. But, this but movie yeah, was, it was a hit. This was made for nothing at the time. This is like eighty million, especially. That's for still this, a lot. Well, for how much CG there is, it really isn't. Like, I think a Jurassic Park budget was somewhere close to like a hundred. Really? Yeah. How about no, Jurassic 100, Park? A hundred like million two. blockbusters were not. I mean, James Cameron's the guy that really, really pushed that. But this one, I mean, yeah, I guess if you compare it to Titanic or even True Lies, yeah, this is uh, not. Uh, up to that level, this is probably closer to what a Bond film's budget was. Yeah, and it looks like a Bond film. This is big and it's over the top. You have large scale sets, grand design. It's an international cast. You got cool cars. You got planes. You got you got a, a river boat, a, a library. Talking about the library, that Domino bookshelf gag is something that you <laughs> would never see in a movie nowadays. No, no, you I, it's just Rachel Weisz's character. You know, like she's. She's not dumb, but she's she's kind of you she's know, just a damsel she's, in distress. Yeah, she's also she's the clumsy woman. Like, yeah, I mean, right when you set her up, it's like, yeah, she's the one who in almost every scene, no matter how how smart she is, no matter how how competent she is, she's in this movie. She's kind of the one that screws everything up, right down ah, to just that. that everyone library. screws every, everything she's up. She's responsible this movie. for everything bad that happens. That's no. big in this. Yeah, her she's brother that, is equally who reads from the Book of the Dead. Her brother's like, equally responsible, though. He's the oh, one that he, finds the yeah, key, he finds the map. He's the stupid one that's drunk half the time. Then when yeah. you follow the rest no, but of the she's franchise, responsible it's even for the more big so. things that happen that are bad for them. Well, it's because she's just curious. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the funny things that's kind of left out of this I'm film is kind of like a joke. Stereotypes. They make this joke. Her her name is Evelyn like Carnahan. Um, that's the name of the daughter of the dude that found uh, King Tut's tomb. And so she has that line where she's like, oh, my father's a, a very famous, famous, famous explorer or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to wink at that, I guess, in the, the tie-in novel. It's much more grand. And also in the tie-in novel, you get a name for the awesome white cat in this movie. His name is Cleo. Um, <laughs> should have said that in the film. That would have been cool. I, I love how they just like kind of throw – because the mythology here is so scatterbrained. Like it doesn't even exist. I hope that's something that in the Sofia Botella, Tom Cruise – Dark Universe 1 is really expanded upon because it's just like, oh, this guy is a is a, a basically a priest to the pharaoh and then he fucks his wife, which is a no go. Um, and they do the worst thing ever possible to him to turn him into like a super powered god. Yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> the same plot of uh, the original mommy, except, you know, they really up the spectacle and they just decide rather than going with horror, they go with the Indiana Jones route. The, they also say like Jason the Argonauts was a prime example. But this is the kind of movie that really... Um, we don't get this anymore. Not only do we not get this anymore, but like the Uncharted video game series feels like We will hopefully like get one of these pretty soon. But yeah, I mean, hopefully yeah. That, that first Tom Holland movie like, will feel like this. But Indiana those Jones games... is the closest thing that we got, really, because like how many archaeological uh, slash treasure hunt movies, I guess, or mm-hmm. artifact uh, uh, hunt movies do you get like this? That it had to pieces? have been like a popular thing in the era that George Lucas was inspired by to make Indiana Jones yeah. like, in the 40s but, and I mean, 50s. This is like no doubt influenced by that. Egypt and like mummies and all of that were so hot in the 30s during the original franchise because King Tut sarcophagus was literally found like 10 years before that, that mm-hmm. first franchise began. It was the, the hottest thing at the time. I've, I've done the King Tut exhibit when it came to LACMA. I think it was like 10 years ago now. I still have the t-shirt. Um, sadly, like not everything was there because it had to be curated or like uh, touched up or something like that. But it was awesome seeing these slabs that are like four or 5,000 years old. Um, just really, really cool, especially being with my Jewish family and going to see this stuff. It's like, we might have built the fucking pyramids, dude, but now we're going to see it because you're dead. Uh, and I still, I think the best part of this movie, flat out, is when Benny, this fucking weasel of a dude, <laughs> is like praying to all the deities, pulls out his Christian cross, yeah. pulls out like his Buddhist thing, pulls out this, and then he gets his, his star David and he starts talking the in Hebrew. The language of the slaves. The slaves! Yeah. Here's some gold! Do you want the gold? And he's like, yes! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like that's you know you just know someone at Universal the producer someone on the board is like we're all Jewish this is gonna be a, a good joke everyone's gonna love it it's okay because yeah. we made the joke but they, oh, that joke kills 
in theaters that had to be like the one huge joke because there's so many funny oh, lines he's in like, this. He's, he's coming up and he's like really one. threatening and that's the one that stops. <laughs> uh, you, you know, just Benny in general, like, you know, total coward, but, uh, you know, totally really, likable though. Yeah, in really a weird fun way. to watch. Like, uh, you know, the, I mean, just this, the cast in general, like, yeah, the whole cast, this is not really a good script in fact honestly th- this movie's yeah. pretty dumb when you get down to it oh very yeah 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 this but, is but action set pieces just, and a just monster give it their all everybody is giving it their yeah, all john like, Hanna. yeah like i mean just rachel vice fully committed brendan fazier you got the, the whatchamacallit the which, speaking of which brendan fazier as an action hero like who would have thunk it right uh, who would have thunk it i mean and i think that's something that steven summers managed to get out of him because i, I know rob cohen did not pull it off with him, like I Brendan think he Fraser was just, just past didn't his prime. seem like the same guy when it came to the third movie. But Brendan Fraser is like the weirdest actor because he started off. He almost he looks like Encino Man when he's coming out of that prison right? cell. Isn't like, that cool? but he still wait. You haven't seen right Encino Man though. In this, have you seen Encino Man? No, no, no. I've seen the poster. I know <sighs> what he. Losing. I know what he looks like. Um, and, like, there's a moment. It just it's really when he's in prison where it looks like it looks like goofy Brendan Fraser, like you would expect. But dude, he went no, from. He, Nowhere in the early 90s, like, in hot titles that were showing off his acting chops, like, uh, School Days, not School Days, well, he is in that, um, School Ties. He's, like, one of the, the very serious roles in that. And, like, every all the guys in that movie went on to be people like Chris O'Donnell becoming Robin, you know? Like, they all they all got franchises out of that film. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman's in that movie, among others. But, yeah, you know, he's in Encino Man, he's in the rest of the Pauly Shore movies he's in, as cameos, he's in Son-in-Law, he's in, uh, in the Army Now. Um, and he had, like, a couple of things here or there that no one really saw. Um, I did, though. George of the Jungle is the movie that got Stephen Summers to get him, because he saw something there, and he's like, yeah, he could be there, Errol Flynn, he could be a swashbuckler, let's try it. But after this movie, or even better yet, the year of this movie, he was in a ton of shit. He was in Airheads a couple of years before this with Adam Sandler. That's a really interesting movie if you haven't seen it. It's on Netflix with uh, Steve Buscemi. Basically, the idea is like this local band wants to become famous, so they hijack a uh, yeah, a Sandler's radio station. No, I do want to see it. It's a point. it's a cool movie. It's it like only in the '90s type of it's, thing. It's like all the stuff I've seen with him in the '90s. Uh, he's he's always just been some kind of dumb, just goofy guy, mm-hmm. like. That seems like I, I he's a he you know could have been this, Jimmy the Stewart. The first thing that comes to mind is this forgotten movie called The Scout with um yeah, Albert baseball Brooks. movie, yeah, mm-hmm. which isn't that funny and gets pretty dark. But it's it's just you compare that and then there's this, this and it's like or better holy yet, holy shit, Brendan Fraser can be an action hero. He can he could be a have, real badass. I swear to God, he could have been like the next Tom Hanks. And for some reason, his career just vanished because he is in really good stuff. The same year this came out, he's in Blast from the Past, which is one of my favorite romantic comedies. It is uh, like the perfect fish out of water tale, like up there with Wonder Woman, okay? What if this guy, what if this, this family got scared and they thought, in the 50s that they were being attacked that there was nuclear fallout and they went into their their bomb shelter for 40 years and then their son comes out as a grown man a product of the 50s and these two humans he's only ever known his whole life and starts walking around turn of the century los angeles oh and that's throw alicia silverstone in there too and a great cast of characters such a good movie too good of a movie great great soundtrack too um and in that one he's like the the ultimate male lead, like even more in this than he is in this film. But then he's like doing weird shit, like Monkey Bone and Looney Tunes back in action. And then he has like serious stuff again at the end of his career, even though his career is technically not over. Like Crash in 2004, where he came out of nowhere. It's like, <laughs> oh, right. what? He's the yeah. fucking mayor of LA? Where the fuck did that come from? That's so weird. Uh, but nowadays, like he's no one. Like he had one last chance. He had Mummy 3 and he had uh, Journey to Center Earth. But, Which did well, I'm, you know, sure, but enough to get a sequel. Like, and he didn't do he was, well for some he reason. He was fine in that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I and am a fan of him, especially in this period, and it's probably because of this movie. Because perhaps you missed this first installment, but I remember 1999 or 2000. I was all about it because mm-hmm. I may have not liked horror movies, and I may also still not like them uh, currently. But this isn't that. Like, this isn't even scary. Not even a little bit. Even well, like the, the handful of jump, jump scares. A lot, like as a kid, you know, the like, handful the of jump scares. Did. I mean, but I still would have loved it. Like, this would have been horror that's acceptable for like a kid like me who, you know, would have been fucking traumatized by something like, uh, 
I, I don't know, like Friday the 13th maybe at the time. Like this would have been good enough to scare me where I could feel it and then still be okay at the end, you know? It's What's funny like Indiana is... Jones, which would get, I mean, it, s- the fucking same face is melting in the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, yeah. that freaked me the ripping fuck someone's out when I first heart, saw that. Ripping someone's heart out their chest. Um, uh, not even that. I mean, the, when that wall came crushing down, coming down with the spikes, that's really what got to me in Temple of Doom. Like the fucking heart was nothing. The funny thing about this movie too is that you know, we're talking like, oh, the budget, like it's so big for the time. Like there's, mm-hmm. there is a lot of CG here, but it's mostly for creature effects because, hey, you can't make that, you you can't do a transparent mummy and like see him through his mouth and shit. Or like the sandstorms, you can't do that with practical effects. It's just impossible. But there's just something here that is missing in cinema today. It, it's the likable cast. It's the set pieces. But more than anything is how international or universal the film is that it is literally shot in morocco or egypt like this is the middle east this is on location that you are using a cast that is mostly from that territory and this film continues that tradition where it just it it feels grand like there this does this is a fun swashbuckling uh like uh tomb like treasure exploration film where uh, around every corner there's something new there's a new joke there's a new gag maybe there's mm-hmm. a scare here or there there's a monster that you're scared of the fucking scarabs man even if the cg doesn't <laughs> quite hold up that's like well, when it's under your skin you know th- i mean that it just the idea of it yeah like that would have freaked me out as a kid but mm-hmm. you know we got to talk about the cg because if, for the most part it like if you look at it just as a still no it doesn't hold up but it, it in still motion. works yeah. really I the mean, sandstorm like, and, looks awesome and this is what really got me thinking about it like of why uh, cg i think works better in movies from back then because back then you really only used it when you had to like when yeah. you had literally no other choice now it's just uh, i'm know, lazy we can well not lazy i i think we overdo it like when we do entire cg shots and we make them incredibly detailed then you know, there's so much to take in that you don't really have one thing necessarily to focus on. It's great that you can do that, but it, it seems like stuff is kind of just thrown in there because it can be like, it, you know, even if it wasn't thought of, like it, it's it's it almost seems like it is too much, honestly, rather than just focusing on the things that you actually need. And uh, yeah, you know, here it can be fake as shit, but you know, for the most part, like. Uh, you know, I think Umotep still holds up. He actually. does, yeah. Like, no, yeah Umotep as a character, and his just CG, the way that he moves, like yeah. how detailed he is, yeah, it's it real good. Really, it still looks like it's rendered in the '90s, but really holds up well. The mummies towards the end of the film, they hold up pretty yeah, well, well, just because it's, it's kind of a mix of makeup and, uh, or, you know, like some of them are actually um, some of them are CG, some of them are makeup, yeah. some of them are like a hybrid. Like Emotep is a hybrid. It's it's him wearing motion tracking and them like basically doing rotoscoping on his body like, and how he interacts with benny too in that scene like it works really really well it's it's seamless um talk about not always though because like th- there is a moment where brendan fraser is fighting mummies that clearly aren't there in real the life funny he's thing, just he's just jumping in the air and you know you yeah tell. the funny thing about that scene the one where like he uh he has a sword and he slashes the guy in front and he reaches back gets the head and there's it there there was no reference there there's no people there he's just choreographing yeah, it, it some looks fight like moves. he's just hopping around because there's it's, no impact like he's for the, the time though it's pretty it, yeah, like, convincing I can it, but it's like it's, it's kind of silly now the, well the movie itself is pretty silly like they're like i We've i can't even better at stuff like that like hey for transformers or, or hell like if you're it's looking different at the Hulk, though i think like, they have know, hey here's someone wearing a backpack with a giant ball that's like they have reference 10 points feet over now. their heads they have someone to look at or they have someone in a green suit or they have actors like this is the beginning you know this is ilm really swinging for the fences like they always going, had someone on set there making sure that they could do what they had to do Maybe, but Emotep, just Arnold Voslo or the Eastern European Billy Zane, for the longest time, I could have sworn he was Billy Zane as a kid. I thought they were the same actor, maybe because, like, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about their facial structure that's similar. Yeah. He's in, like, he's in, he was in a couple things. And then, like, same goes for Arnold Voslo. Like, he's in the two Mummy movies. He's in uh, G.I. Joe, Rise of Cobra, he, and also that Stephen the Summers. sequel. Like, I guess they're good friends. Yeah, they're good friends. He was in Odd Thomas for a bit, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's in Odd Thomas. Yeah. Um, I think we mentioned that he he just he pops up here or there, and besides the fact that he's bald, like I think if you put hair on him or you made Billy Zane bald, 
like he, like who could he be? But the Billy Zane could have been successful like, if he was in different areas, like the Brandon Fraser thing. He was in a superhero movie. He was in the Phantom. Yeah, the yeah, Phantom yeah, didn't do well, hey, but it could have done well. Hey, but um, he wasn't. He's not in this movie. So no, he's fun. not. But yeah. as a kid, I always thought he was. I just <laughs> like because you don't know this Arnold Voslo guy. Like you don't know who no. he is. No, you just, but yeah, he's got a good presence. Like he seems like a guy that would be you know like one of those bond uh, henchmen that always looks really he, tough and is he really totally quiet is one of those like he's in, like he's like one of the guys that bond has like an awesome fight scene with before he gets to the main villain to take care of them and he dies in some awesome way he's like one of those guys he literally is that character in gi joe rise of cobra he plays I, the, yeah i wish i could remember who he was he's yeah. the guy that poses as the president at the very end of the movie the guy that can That's take on right. any yeah, the, person the guy that whistles yeah yeah the guy um, that whistles yeah he's like mystique basically in that universe speaking of emotep though like the, I just, I'm sorry. I, I gotta get your reaction. I love my I, wife. Did you not th- find the wardrobe for him a bit ridiculous? Like it, it looked like he's wearing a tidy. It looked like the '90s Egyptian hybrid of someone going into, you know, like a, a, a tech noir club or something in the '90s. Like, no, I can't. I, it, it looked like he was getting ready to go into that club in the Matrix. I can't me. really judge it because I saw it when it came out. I, I kind of just see like, it as yeah, a product but that was of one its thing time, that seems and I'm so doing dated to me now. I was just like, rewatch. yeah, that's that's kind of funny. No, it's like it's a weird. It, it looks like it looks like a product of the '90s of '90s wardrobe. Like he I looks think they like would actually look like that though. Club. Like if this is the way he's wearing it, though, man. It they were it, trying to do their best to you know. Uh, recreate the fashion leather. of what is it like 2500 bc or what is it, like 3500 well it's that's when it's supposed it, it, to be it it's supposed to be the, like not, the 1930s it but, definitely didn't look like that you know it's not like he would update his fashion and i the rest of the people their fashion is great like the suspenders and like the scarves and you know just having like benny wearing uh his fez and everything yeah, um, it up, like when he was fully you know fully clothed fully skinned um like just looked like he was going out to a club like refresh my memory maybe you've seen the the mummy returns more recently no i have not seen that since i was a kid if i remember correctly i know for a fact evie and and chris o'connell or whatever fucking rick o'connell that they have a son the son yeah. somehow the gets son his bracelet. Puts on a bracelet and that's the, that's the main thing yeah the bracelet yeah, like the, the rock is, is in that movie too for like a second yeah that's it's his like, first movie it's him being the Scorpion King, and then the Scorpion mm-hmm. King is showing you how he became the Scorpion King. Um, but yeah, the bracelet does some kind of bullshit. Who cares? But I think what the story there is literally a continuation of this one, and Emotep comes back, and he literally succeeds in getting his his uh, mistress alive. I, yeah, I can't and remember. Then they want more after that. I, I think um, I think so, but I, I think the big thing in the movie too, because then I, if I remember correctly, Rick Vice has with the Scorpion King. So I well, I can't yeah, but the Scorpion King is a good guy like he sees like the our protagonist is struggling and he turns on emotep and he like sacrifices himself i want to say and he has no I'm dialogue sure. it's He's like the good guy in the scorpion king but i don't know i kind of remember it being the other way for the sake of the mummy returns well he looks well it's like it's the he was the, literally a scorpion too like it pulls a um a quick one on you where throughout the film you think he's the bad guy like the second villain and then i do believe that he's actually just an anti-hero at the end and he he saves the day and they're like oh thank you or whatever and he's like yeah he he doesn't speak in english like it's all <laughs> it's all subtitles i will one day it's so, yeah something like that he's like don't worry i'm about to be a movie star it's worth it yeah. people will love this shit uh i remember cuz i actually watched wwf back when um the scorpion king was coming out and they pub like pushed that shit so hard i remember the trailers for the mummy returns were like and the rock as the scorpion king and i was like who the fuck is that and now i remember watching what's the point of that like like like, smackdown and raw and seeing the rock in the ring like and you can catch me next friday in theaters (laughs) i kind of want to watch like rewatch the mummy returns for that reason to see why that's such a big deal because i i only remember it starts with him i want to say and then such a big deal that they had to do a spinoff, which I'm no, not I complaining because that spinoff was a lot of fun. I but... want to say they start the film kind of like this film where you have a prologue that deals with the Scorpion King and then he shows up. Oh, yeah, no, no, film. no, they do. Uh, they, you, they have a battle for um, yeah. and everything for him. And then I remember you see him at the end, but I don't I, I can't I don't remember the movie that well. But I do. I remember that as far as how how um, present he is in the sequel. Uh, probably one of the cooler things about this film, especially since they're going for like a horror vibe, and out of the director's list, one of the p- 
people that they didn't approach for some reason is Sam Raimi because he was free in this time frame. It's 1999. He wasn't doing it. He was directing for love of the game. He's, you know, he's not doing horror anymore. They have a book of the dead. They have the Necronomicon ex mortis for all intents and purposes. And then they have like the book of the life or whatever you want to call it. They have the, the Amon Ra, the, the reverse version. And it's like uh, you're watching. It's like I can't help but not think of Evil Dead. Seriously, like it, yeah. especially the I, I way mean, the zombies just, look, the way Emotep looks, the way he's like taking the eyes and the just, tongue from the dude. Rule. And Do not read from the Book of the Dead. If you've seen Evil Dead, you know that's a bad thing. Evie, what the fuck are you doing? I said the words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love how, like, when she opens the book and then just there's that gust of wind that goes there and Brendan Fraser's just like, oh, yeah, that, that happens, happens a lot. Here. A lot. Yeah. It happens here a lot. Like, it, it's it's aware of how just, like, hokum, it's, to it's use really the word in the movie. It's a lot of fun. Like, Rachel Weiss, and she just kind of pointed just where these kind of movies would go, said in an interview, you know, she's not a fan of horror. The only reason she did this because it seemed like a comic book world to her. And it totally is. Like, this is... It, nowadays, this would basically be considered a superhero film. I think that's how the new Mummy is going to be seen. Like, not as a horror reboot, unless it has scary elements, which I highly doubt. And it's more going to be the action star, blockbuster, like... I'm assuming Tom Cruise kind of is now, because he... I don't know, based on the trailer, he should be dead and wakes up indestructible, or is immortal now. I don't fucking oh, know. Like, I, I think the way it works is... The only way this new mummy, the Sofia Botella mummy, can come to life is by like leeching onto a human. And so, if she want, if she's immortal, so is he. Like they're tied together. I don't fucking know, but he's uh, he's, know, he's gonna become a superhero essentially, and she's like you know a supervillain. But Tom it, it's gonna is be already a superhero. He was almost in this movie. He climbed the Burj, man. He, he was almost this Rick O'Connell. Really? Yeah, there's like a long list of people it could have been. Leonardo DiCaprio was almost it, but instead he had to shoot the beach, and I'm sure he regrets that every day of his life. Like he's ne- like maybe he was in the Titanic and he's in the Revenant and he's been in like Wolf of Wall Street. He's been in successful movies, but he's never had a franchise, which is kind of well, weird. You know, I'm glad that we got to see Brendan Fraser do this. And I'm For glad sure, it's it is yeah. his role that made really his well. career. He it's, owned it. It's the one thing where. You know, people saw this and they wanted to see him in more things. And sadly, America stopped giving a shit for some reason. I don't know well, I, what I kind mean, of I, agent I or just, manager he has, but they didn't work hard enough. I mean, he seems like he kind of just does want to play that goofy guy. Like that's his thing. You know, he also he he played a good character on Scrubs. Uh, what else did he do? Like, he did a lot of stuff. It, he just into him. Just, yeah, I, I guess this that's was what his he, one he big was thing. More into. Like he said, look into Blast from the Past. If you haven't seen Monkey Bone, it's a really fucking weird oh, movie. Man. But he's good I, in yeah. that. Like. He he's a good actor. It's just he was yeah. totally underutilized. He even an insano man, despite having almost no dialogue in that movie. It's like a, a basically silent acting. He's really funny. Like he he's good at slapstick. Like he has just this this on screen charisma that you don't find very often. Like I said, it's like a Tom Hanks, uh, like a uh, Jimmy Stewart type of thing. Where and he's from Indianapolis, just like Stephen Summers. So I'm not sure they grew up together, but they have that Midwest charm about them. Like oh I'm a Hoosier and we kind of stopped wanting that we wanted you know the sexy guy even even if he does you know and you have that great moment where it's like you said he looks like George of the Jungle or he looks like Encino Man and then he shows up again like a scene later and Rachel Weisz is like weak in the knees because like what what happened I thought you were <laughs> the scruffy yeah, guy like with trash, the man. with the bad breath yeah. but now you're really fucking sexy and I I want you and I I think that he um I don't know, maybe he, when his looks started deteriorating, then that's when he stopped getting the roles. Because even in Mummy 3, you know, he's now he's he looks like, a bit older. He's, yeah. He looks, yeah, a good margin older. But he didn't get cast in between those things, really. Like, he did shit. Like, I need to rewatch Loon Tunes back in action someday. Because that had to be him going for the moon. Like you said, he likes these zany roles. He's like doing the slapstick. He he likes doing body then, acting. I mean, that movie should be great if it, it wasn't should for be. studio interference. It's like yeah, Jenna just... Elfman, Steve Martin, Brendan Fraser, Joe Dante, Looney Tunes. You have good cameos. And yeah. So they should have learned from Gremlins too. Hey, let's get let this guy do whatever the fuck he wants. I don't know. It'll pay off in the. They long also run. wanted Space Jam too, you know, like they wanted that. And bring Joe Dante for that. That would be amazing. Nah, that would probably actually be really bad because he. I don't ever want to see him work with the Looney Tunes again. The first time was uh, was amazing. The second time was really bad. I don't want to see a third. That that would be. Well, 
That'd hey, be third a disaster. Time's a charm. No, it's not. Know. But hey, not um, for the Mummy. Definitely not for Looney Tunes live action. I don't think. Hey, you never know. Um, but hey, uh, in this case, it's a dime a dozen. But it's a really, really good dime a dozen. You know, like the only reason I I, dis- I was wrestling between that or Silver Dollar, and I'm just it's going with Silver that Dollar. because. Yeah, no, I mean, there are there are stronger movies like this, you know? Like, there is Indiana Jones, which is probably... Well, Indiana Jones this, is a different you know? kind of thing, though. Like, it yeah, is but, but it is, so it is that kind of archaeological adventure yeah. with some supernatural um, elements at play. It's, it's you know, like, there's different stuff there, but it's... I uh, think the difference in Indiana Jones, it's though... It's that same kind of adventure. Is that you have this professor. You have this guy that's been bred by his father. Yeah, he's characters, got a absolutely. lineage, you know, he's a boy scout. He he's smart as hell. It's more contemporary. It has true bad guys, you know, there's Nazis. And then there's also the the evil mythical power at at play. Whereas this is a group of people that just want treasure, that are silly. But there's also an evil mythical power at play. There is, are... but they are responsible for it being there. It's not but like it there's... Is the, it's closest to that. Really. It is. As, it, there's obviously differences. And, and yeah, like as far as like that kind of adventure and that kind of fun and I... those kind of, you know, small scares and bits of humor in there, yeah, it's definitely... Like it was, this was definitely inspired by that. This um, is a lot funnier, a little grander, and it, it just this wants to be more of a blockbuster. I think yeah. Indiana Jones was more um, just the talent pool that went into it between Harrison Ford, George Lucas, like Captain Kennedy, uh, Steven Spielberg. You got so many, and when you get like further and further into it, you, you know, you got James Bond, you got Sean Connery himself in the Last role. Crusade, I, th- I think, is probably on par with this, except way better, just as far as that kind of movie. Because, yeah, Last Crusade has so many laughs, has... Uh... It's uh, an international, scale. international scale. It's going. It has like in like five different, six different countries. It has so many different They're languages. They're both and pretty it, similar there, but uh, I mean, you know, this just man, it's it's like it's it's weird because when I think about it, it's not that much of a movie. You know, it's it's not mm-hmm. really a solid script. It, it really is the cast that really just gives it their all, and like everyone is. Um, you know, on the technical front is just freaking killing it and just working their ass off. And they make a really, really, really entertaining movie. And it's it's also worthy just as like a historic look uh, back at how, you know, CGI was utilized back then. And just a look at the kind of blockbuster that we don't get anymore. You know, it really, it has a epic adventure feel. And, you know, I mean, hell, even, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about. But yeah, I mean, this even inspired a ride at Universal Studios. Have you been I on that ride? Going on, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it actually what, what inspired two rides. again? Because I can't... What was... It inspired two rides. The first thing was on the studio tour, there was a section that you went through a tunnel yeah. um, where it was like you're going through the Scarab Tunnel. And when mm-hmm. you came out of it, the tour guide was replaced by a skeleton. And it was a fun gag. Um, and it was like Whoopi Goldberg was on the video too. Like it was weird. And then uh, they replaced that um, basically with the King yeah, Kong one 360. For the Mummy Returns that tied in. Yeah. So they they replaced that section of the studio tour f- with the the King Kong experience instead. And then uh, when they replaced that, they opened the actual roller coaster. And the roller coaster, which is still there, it's not gone. Um, oh, I thought it went away. No, it's not gone. They got rid of ET instead uh, and Backdraft. But the the lower lot at LA still has or Hollywood, rather, still has the Mummy ride. It has a Q video, which was directed by Steven Summers, as a really cool Q, which coincidentally feels a lot like the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland, except it never breaks down. And it's a roller coaster roller coaster. It's a cool one, too, because you go all the way through, and then you literally ride it backwards. Um, I have some fun experiences on that ride, uh, especially when I worked at Universal Studios. But it's, yeah, like, the, the, the I think the real reason why this film is interesting Despite, like, you know, Batman Begins really getting credit for making reboots a thing, this is a full six years earlier. This proved that you could take not just a film, but also a franchise, a successful one, a very successful one from a studio, and modernize it, even if it's still in period. I mean, this is a full on reimagining. Yeah. Like, compared to that, absolutely. Because it does take the basis of the original mummy there as far as Emotep trying to get back his. uh... Yeah, you know, being reawakened and trying to get back his love, but yeah, it does it in a very modern way and just goes a completely different route while also being faithful to what was there before. And something that Universal tried to touch into again. Obviously, they made two sequels for this. They made an animated series. You got the roller coaster. They had all. I forgot of, about they that. They had the video games. You know, all the toys and whatnot. Yeah. I, 
but it then was a big, big franchise. Freaking Steven Summers so makes much, Van Helsing. I remember freaking Taco Bell tie-ins for the Mummy Returns. Like it, it was big. It's like every movie the back then had. Ta- I remember the Godzilla yeah. Taco Bell tie-in. Like if because blockbusters were so nuanced. Sorry, Del Taco, not Taco Bell. Uh, well, Taco Bell is definitely Godzilla. Um, even like blockbusters were so few and far between. You get one like every month, every two months back then. Everyone had like a big like one or two month production can or not production marketing campaign where you couldn't wait to see it. You didn't even it didn't matter if you didn't want to see it in the first place. You're like, oh, I have to see it now because everyone's gonna see this movie. And this was right at that time frame, like the 1990, like late 90s, early 2000s, when movies, you know, just the era when we were growing up, becoming teenagers, where we were just lucky to be at the pinnacle of the blockbuster era. Now we're at like I guess you would call it the golden age or something. But they under stood then you know like 20 years after star wars or like 15 years after nana jones in terms of what works what do audiences want to see what should we ten make years right after now Jurassic Park. yeah and well almost 10 years and they just they got it like they knew what to do they we need a big production we need jokes and we need adventure we need this we need a good cast we need good production design we we want this let's make the t-shirts let's do this let's make the theme park rides like Universal tapped into it, and they're trying to tap into that again. They didn't have success with Dracula Untold. They didn't have it with Van Helsing, but hopefully... Van Helsing was fun, though, man. But um, they did, you know, it wasn't a smash-through hit. I think that's because they try to overburden that. It did fine. Like, we left out the other one when uh, th- they made a Wolfman reboot. I saw it in theaters. That's right. It was right. horrible. It was yeah. really bad. Like, it, it, it could have been good. Every time Universal uses one of their monsters, it can be good. It just they they kind of lost the touch. They should have just let Steven Summers literally do it all. He should have been Zack Snyder's. He should have been Where the shepherd now, for man? the franchise. He's well, nowhere. He, he basically was the shepherd for that property for three movies. Uh, you know, he was typecast as the guy that was doing that. Like yeah. if they had the not even the foresight, but the the if they had the hindsight. They literally had, like, Universal, the reason why Dark Universe is the only one that actually deserves a shared universe is because they had one originally. They had Abin Costello meets Frankenstein. They had the House of Dracula. They had House of Frankenstein. They had literal crossovers with all their monsters in a time when that was unparalleled. Even in comic books, that didn't really happen back then. Like, the Justice League didn't exist until, like, I think it's the 50s or 60s. Like, a full 20 years or 10 years after those Adam Costello. Like, they have Adam Costello. They have Frankenstein. Let's put them together. Like, whoever came up with that was a fucking genius, and no one knows that guy's name. I still want to see that. I think the fact that they made those monster movies into comedy somehow is the reason why this is a comedy that has monsters in it. Yeah, you know, it, it it became that crossover, like that led to the blockbusters we have now, where it isn't one set tone. It's not just adventure. You have to laugh at it. You have to cry. You want to fall in love. You want to be scared. You, it's gonna touch all of your emotions at once. Like it is literal escapism, where you get the the hallmark of humanity in one outing. And this one almost does it. It does it pretty damn well. Like I, I can't buy it anymore because there are better versions. But this is a total like, if I'm at the Goodwill and they got it for twenty five cents, hell yeah, I'm gonna it's, buy it. Like I'll even buy like, all three. You know, like it's a dime a dozen, and of that dozen, this is one of the better ones. It is. It's a very solid movie. It's a very good movie. It just it has problems with its grip. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you like this show and you want to hear more of our wonderful voices on a weekly basis. Check out Two Cents. I'll recap what's happened in film, TV, and tech news. We're also on the titular Dollar Review Show, a spoiler-free critique of new releases or anything we've discovered on our own, whether that be TV, music, etc. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollar reviews. Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. But more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a death to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, 
You can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis. That's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S. And now you know how to spell the email too. And also under the same name on the Love You site, Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films that I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX. And also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change.